people, power, and placemaking. There is not an organizer we interview on this program who doesn't talk about the crisis of real estate. Groups need places to work and meet and come together, especially in an era like ours of isolation and virtual connections. But what does community building look like in a time of privatization and shrinking common space? What models exist for viable, self-sustainable community property? places. My guests today are giving all of this a lot of thought. They're two of the people behind the Women's Building Project in New York City. It is remaking and reimagining a former women's prison and turning it into a new women's community for transformation and justice and impact. The project so far has involved a collective and complex process. Here to talk about that and what has been learned is Pamela Schiffman, Executive Director of the Novo Foundation, and Iris Bowen, Program Coordinator for the Coming Home Program at the Mount Sinai St. Luke's Institute for Advanced Medicine. Welcome both. We should say at the start that the Novo Foundation and Pamela are big supporters of this program, so you're not going to get brutal attacking questions. <laughs> um, I'll just be upfront about that. <laughs> This process, though, I thought was important enough that we should bring it to our audience because it's complicated. Creating space, creating space in space that is so loaded, in a time that's so fraught. Um, why, why a building of all your possible priorities, Pamela? Well, a women's building has been wanted, desired, worked for, hoped for in New York City for decades. Since I joined Novo 10 years ago, I asked activists from all over the world what they most needed to be most impactful in their work advocating for girls and women's rights. And what I kept hearing over and over again was the importance of space, the importance of being able to connect with peer organizations, to learn from each other, to organize together. And so when we had the opportunity to support the development of a building to do just that, and it was a former women's prison, to be able to turn a place of pain and confinement into a place of justice and healing and liberation and possibility, we knew we absolutely had to make that happen. Has New York ever had a women's building? Hmm. There have been attempts to have a women's building. In the early 1970s, a group of women occupied a space in the East Village um, to create a women's building. So there have been kind of starts and stops. There's a really fantastic women's building in San Francisco, and the executive director of that building is very actively involved in the women's building in New York City. We're building a huge community of women who are helping make this possible. So Iris, tell us a little bit about this building. It's on West 20th Street, which now is Chelsea, right over on the West Side Highway. If you've ever been in a traffic jam right there, um, you might have passed it. What's been its history? What is that building to you? Well, it was home for me for at least four years. And so when you say Chelsea, I used to look out the window and say, boy, I wish I was out there, you know. But um, it was home for me up and down the stairs for four years. And um, so now that it's turning into something more meaningful and more powerful, I'm very excited. Now, the building was having problems before um, the decision to close it. And am I right in thinking the decision to close it that was made by the state was because of Hurricane Sandy? Was that it? Yes, that what is happened? correct. Uh, hur when Hurricane Sandy came, um, the water flooded the building and um, they decided to close it. They shipped the women out to another facility and um, they then closed it. So what complications present themselves as you think of taking over this building? One thing that's really important in taking over the building is making sure that we maintain the history of what happened in that place mm -hmm. and that we use this as an opportunity to educate people about the ongoing incarceration of women and the fact that this is absolutely a nightmare for women in this country and that we are locking up the most marginalized women in our country um, at rates that are you know, the fastest growing prison population in this country are of women. Mm -hmm. So we are, we need to make sure that we, you know, maintain the history and also create a space that imagines something new and that is actually going to be a building that serves the, you know, movements for social justice now and 99 years from now. Mm -hmm. So we really need to put a lot of thought into this and a lot of creativity. And so we have been building a huge community of people. You know, Iris has 
been on the advisory circle for the Women's Building along with many other incarcerated women, who, formerly incarcerated women who are activists, as well as activists from across the world who are working to advance justice for girls and women everywhere. And really thinking about how we can create a space that's flexible and that is going to really allow us to do the best work possible. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a, well, you tell me. When I heard that the prison was being closed, I was both happy and also conscious that this is a big hit for the families that wanted to, that need to visit mm -hmm. their incarcerated members. Yes, absolutely. What happens to them? So um, they have to travel perhaps on the Metro North or take a bus. So it's a, a, it's a longer commute to get to see the family. And probably um, the desire was to get to Bayview to be closer to your family. So they, they were shipped out to different places. And so, you know, a little hardship on the family to get to a visit. So it's not just good news when a Right, it's good news closes. for some and, you know, good news for, I mean, bad news for others. So, yeah, it was good news. Uh, basically, we were happy that it closed. But for those that were, you know, that are inside, it, and they had to move, pack up everything and move. It's like moving your whole life somewhere else, so. Tell us yeah. about who you think of, who you knew there. Is there someone who you carry in your heart as you do this work? Yeah, there's a lot of women. Um, I went back to visit, and uh, when you go in to visit, you can't speak to the women. So I saw a lot of women, and I was like, oh, my God. And so when I left that day, I was heartbroken because, you know, some of the women are there doing 50 years. They were young when they came in. Uh, I mean, you know, these are people that ripped years. off banks and the whole American po population <laughs> through mortgage No, kind of no. Um, some of them, um, to be honest, a lot of the women there have um, domestic violence issues. I would say more than half the population has issues with domestic violence or they were with men that uh, taught them how to sell drugs or, you know. Stuff like that. 90, 95%, I would say, of the population. The majority of the women, domestic violence, over and over again, sexual abuse and just trauma from an early age. You know, I used to sit in the groups there, and I used to hear the women talk about their stories about their brother molested them and raped them and their father and their uncle. And I used to say, you know what, thank God I had a good brother. You know, just hearing the stories, I used to be like, my God, it's sure. traumatic. I was lucky enough to be part of one circle, one kind of listening and, and, and talking circle that Novo com convened around the building. And one of the questions we were prodded <clears throat> with was, you know, if we were to imagine this building 100 years from now and it would be, mm. uh, have been a women's building for 100 years, mm and we had created a world without incarceration, mm -hmm. what mm -hmm. steps would we have taken and what role would this building have played to get us there or some version of that? I'm assuming you've done exercises like that. Can you mm -hmm. imagine I a world imagine. without incarceration and how we get to it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what role does a building play? Okay, I think, like Pamela knows that um, I'm really stuck on women being punished for prostitution. I'm really against that because the woman that's prostituting is probably trying to find an income, that's number one, maybe trying to feed her children. And we, you know, we punish her again as a society. Like, so I would imagine she could come to the women's building and get some skills, get some education, and you know, try to empower her. So that's what I envision the women's building, empowering women to get some skills, um, you know, learn how to open up a bank account or invest your money. And so what's your vision? What, what do you see happening in those, in those halls and, and, and building rooms? Will there be rooms? What's it going to look like? I don't know exactly what the women's building is going to look like in 100 years, but I know that in 100 years people are going to look at the prison cell that is going to be saved and memorialized as part of the building and say, I can't believe 
that they used to lock people up like that. And I can't believe they used to lock people up who'd been victims of violence, who were poor, who were single mothers, who you know, had everything stacked against them and were you know, resisting with all their might to survive. And that we actually locked those people up. That will be um, shocking to the people who go and visit that building. I know that for sure. And the activities that you do know about that, we, that you think will be happening in there are like what? Yeah. Well, after the consultation process that we embarked upon, um, we learned a lot, of, a lot about what the needs were for the community. And so we know that some of the things that are going to happen in that building for sure will be nonprofit office space, conference rooms, the event space, the ability to be able to connect with organizations that are working in different sectors, so economic justice groups can connect with violence against women groups. We'll be able to have impromptu political meetings at night. There's going to be on-site child care. There's going to be a wellness center, a meditative garden. It's an amazing vision, mm. and I'm confident you're going to realize it. Mm. There are some tricky spots along the way, and one yeah. of those is about private property. Mm -hmm. What will be the status of the property? How will it be operated? And how will you mm. shift power around mm. property ownership? Um, how will you model mm -hmm. doing that? Because mm -hmm. I know you will. Mm -hmm. So first of all, the um, the property is actually being leased. So we have entered into a 99 year, a 50 year lease with an opportunity to renew for 49 years from the state. with the state of New York. In terms of the how the building will be run, you know, I think one of the things we're very committed to at every step of the way is that it's going to be values aligned and mission aligned from beginning to end. So we know, for example, that the construction of the building, we are working to increase the number of women in the trades who will be working on the project. We have a commitment of 35% women, which you know, we know in the trades there's 3% women in the trades right now, less than 3%. So 35% women will be working on this project and we're creating a pipeline of good jobs for women in you know, union jobs in the construction trades. We also know that how the building will be run, we're exploring different options now for what that's going to look like, but to make sure that it's um, going to be sustainable and that it is going to be aligned with the values of a new economy that we want to promote, an economy that is not premised on racism and sexism, that is actually about community, that is about um, community accountability. And so we're thinking through all of those with the advisory circle and with this amazing group of activists that are helping to imagine this space together. Will trans women be welcome at the women's building? Of course. Of exactly. Course. Yeah. Yeah. Trans, gay, bisexual, whoever you are. <laughs> come. <laughs> exactly. We may even have a few men, right? Exactly. <laughs> no, we we'll talk I, about I, that. We, I think yeah. We, I, yeah, we talked about if we don't teach the men and the boys, then you know mm -hmm. what's the what's the use? We need to teach them too how how we want this to happen. So finally, I mean, there's so much of what you've been going through that is relevant to our project of kind of remaking mm -hmm. so yeah. many of our relations, our relations around property, our relations around power. People are coming to this project with yes. very distinct levels of power exactly. and property and the familiarity mm -hmm. with dealing with property totally. and development and any of this stuff. What have you learned about how decision making is helped or hurt by those relationships? I will, for me personally, one of the things I feel most um, moved by and proud of in this project is I think that the ways in which everyone who has touched this project and been involved with this project is really committed to doing things differently and doing things in a more transparent and consensus building way and that we do have difficult conversations this there is limited amount of space you know you asked what some of the biggest challenges are the challenges are that it's we need way more buildings like this i mean this is actually the you know this this neighborhood is full of luxury condos so there is, are not activist spaces in this city there are not affordable places for people to work and you know those kinds of things so I think some of the biggest challenges around figuring out how to best use that space and to make sure that it's truly accessible for social justice activists, you know, now and 99 years from now. But I think the ways in which people have come to the table in ways that are truly grappling with hard issues, including space considerations, including notions of gender, you know, you asked if trans women are going to be welcome. Yes, of course trans women are going to be welcome. And we need to think about how is this building going to 
um, welcome everyone. And what is gender going to mean 99 years from now? So it's a women's building that welcomes everyone. And we feel like it's still important to name that women and girls, cis and trans, experience violence, oppression, be because we are women and girls. And that is really important to, mm. to name and to work from. What makes a place welcoming to you, Iris? And by you, I mean you in all of your aspects, including as a formerly incarcerated person. Well, what makes it welcoming, as soon as I come in the door, I should feel like I should be there. As soon as I come to the door, like when I came in this building, I felt like I belong here. So something like that, just a welcome, somebody to greet people when they come in. How are you? Come on in. What are you here for? What do you need? And yeah, welcoming atmosphere. Mm -hmm. Welcoming yeah. atmosphere, a good place to start, maybe a good place to finish. Thank you both. So you can Thank find out you. much more about this project, and we'd love to hear from you if you've ever been involved in a building project like this or comparable projects around the country. Let us know. Mm -hmm.